Okay, so uh, everybody in the room recognizes uh, catenanes, rotaxanes, and then um, um, Alberto, goodness, Alberto did a great job yesterday, was it only yesterday? Um, introducing us into the idea of a molecular shuttle. And so what I'm gonna show you, uh, hopefully in a few slides in 20 minutes, is that when we think about things in solution, as Alberto told us, we think about uh, rings rotating around dumbbells and rings rotating around rings. But of course, I remember when I first started to talk about these things to people who, who didn't know, they would say, well, what's rotating? And of course, in solution, there's no frame of reference. You know, everything's rotating. So, you know, this ring's rotating, but so is this ring. But what we're going to do is we're going we're to put these into frameworks, so we're going to give it a frame of reference. And so the blue dumbbell will not be rotating. It will be a, a frame, framework. And the and the ring will be rotating around a, a, an object that is not moving, and then the same thing, and the same thing here. So, um, metal organic frameworks are just what they, they sound like. They're, they're a combination of uh, what we call metal nodes. So SBU stands for secondary building unit, and uh, you do some coordination chemistry, and you link these nodes with organic linkers, and you can make beautifully uh, porous material. So this is a, one of the examples uh, from the Yagi group uh, from about the turn of the century. Um, so the idea is these are porous materials, um, so they're kind of like the new, the new zeolite, only in moth chemistry you can do what's called reticular synthesis, and it's a, a simple concept. So what you're doing is you're, you're saying, if, if I can make this cubic material with one aromatic ring, then I can make exactly the same topology just by extending the linker. And so it's a, it's a very modular approach. You can use um, more labile metals, you can use single metal lines, you can use clusters, and you can build um, all sorts of frameworks, literally hundreds of thousands of papers on, on this now, and the CCDC is full of x-ray structures like this. Um, so I think the other thing that Alberto kind of said yesterday was that um, literally as far as organic chemistry goes, assume you can pretty much if you can think of something, you can probably make it. And I would say the same thing goes for these frameworks. Um, there are new topologies and things that are discovered all the time, but if you need a cubic framework, there's one there. If you need a diamondoid framework, there's one, there's one there that you can find. So in 2010, uh, Fraser and his group published, along with Omar Yagi, published this terrific perspective in, in uh, Nature Chem. And, uh, and they call this concept that I'm going to talk to you about today robust dynamics. And I think it's a terrific term. So if I just, uh, just quote him here, they propose that these mechanically interlocked molecules that I'm showing you can be inserted covalently into the rigid framework backbone such they are mounted as integrated components capable of dynamics without comprising the fidelity of the entire system. So you're still going to have a framework, but you're going to have these not covalently bound rings and you're going to be able to play the same games you, you can in solution, only going to be able to do it in the solid state. And of course, the advantage of the solid state is that we can now uh, organize these things in arrays. We could perhaps have uh, different machines interacting with other machines in the neighboring unit cell and this kind of concept. So uh, this is taken right from the uh, robust dynamics uh, perspective, and you get, this is the cartoon version, so you can, you can think about modular linkers, you can think about, uh, I guess Lego is the wrong word to use, but some kind of building block set, and you can make cubic arrays in this fashion. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you, um, there's about a handful of these materials uh, that, are, that are known, and I'm just gonna kinda take you through uh, the, the kinds of things that people have done. But before I do that, I want to I kind of convince you uh, that these materials are uh, modular and that, you can, and that you can make all sorts of things. So what I'm trying to show on this slide is uh, the kind of things you, do, you can do synthetically. So you can have the building blocks, you can make these materials, which are uh, essentially uh, repeatable uh, polymers, and you can functionalize them. And you can do this a number of ways. And of course, one of the ways we'll functionalize them is with these mechanical components the, of uh, rotaxanes and, uh, and molecular machines. So one of the things early on that Yagi showed was that if you took the same, so if I go back here, if you took the same linker and you just decorated it 
with whatever you wanted to. You could literally take a soup of these things with different functional groups, and as long as the linker was the same geometric entity, you could make materials that contained, I think he had eight to 10 components just by sort of mixing them together. The trick, of course, is the, the ratios that you mix them together might not be the ratios they're, they're incorporated. And of course, you have to think about where did they go. So do you have large domains? Do you have small domains? Have you got things that are well mixed? Are they randomized? So there's a little bit of art to this. The way you can get around this sort of randomness is you can do what's known as post-synthetic modification. So for example, if I build a material that has these nodes and linkers, I can then, after I've made the material, do some chemistry to install or subtract or add things to them. And so you can do things like uh, post-synthetically change a functional group. Um, so you may have something that's got a easily, easily connected or, or has a blocking agent on it, and you want to put in something that is a little more reactive. You can, you can do this. Uh, you could also do extra coordination at the metal. So some of these will have empty metal sites, and you can add, add things to the metals, and I'll show you an example of that. And then, of course, you could actually do what I would describe as host guest or supramolecular chemistry right inside the material. And so this is a, supposed to be showing the idea of, of uh, incorporating some kind of guest that interacts and comes off and falls through. So people have done, these, these are porous materials, so people have done gas absorption, catalysis, um, drug delivery, all sorts of things with these, and they're very popular, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the other things you can do post-synthetically that's just, it's becoming a, um, we're, we're learning more and more about how to control these things, is you can make uh, uh, core materials, so you can so you can uh, make a shell of one material, and then you can that's maybe not active, and then you can coat that same crystal material post synthetically with another material. And this is a this is a terrific paper that doesn't even have a, a page number yet from Stefan Hecht, where they where they looked at a porous material and then put a, a a diazo switch on the outside, and so they could block the gas coming in. They could do the switching, and then and then fill the pores and reverse that, so with a switch on the outside. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about then is I'm going to tell you about uh, installing these familiar looking things in the solid state. So the idea is we're going to make crystalline arrays that somehow inside are these components that Alberta told us about yesterday, only we're going to be doing this in the solid state. So not surprisingly, um, your linkers aren't going to be bought from Aldridge, you're going to have to make them, and so there's going to be a little bit of uh, synthetic design and, and, and chemistry here. But the nice part is, as Fraser said, I've been doing this for about uh, 10, 15 years, and moth chemistry is, the moth chemists have done a really nice job of getting, keeping ahead of us. And so we can always go into the literature and always some, see some new synthetic technique or some new way of characterizing something. And so I'll show you a little bit uh, about, uh, I think uh, Miguel showed one of these rotors. I'll show you a rotaxane, I'll show you a catenane, where the red ring is rotating, and in ca this case, the framework is gonna be the blue components. And I'll even show you a Benferinga motor. Okay, so the simplest thing, I don't wanna say it's simple, but the simplest of these is to, is to have a rotor, the kind of thing that uh, Miguel showed us uh, yesterday, I guess. Uh, so you can have these fast, fast rotors, you can, uh, he, he's looked at things like the, uh, the viscosity of solutions inside these things. And as he showed us, you can uh, um, characterize this using solid state deuterium NMR. And so you, you get these patterns which tell you uh, about the speed and the mechanism and the, uh, and, and the way the rotor is moving. So there are quite a number of, of, uh, of systems that do this, rotors in the solid state. But for the longest time, making a, a molecular machine work in a in a solid was not a, what is not a thing. The other kind of rotor that, uh, that's been now recently, uh, so 2019, installed into a, uh, into a moth is a Benferinga um, light-driven motor. So these will probably look familiar to you, to you here if, if you know this area, where you have these alternating photochemical and thermal steps to uh, have a unidirectional motor. And so what, what the Feringa group did was they made this layered material, so this carboxylate, uh, and these nodes define the layers, and then they, and then they install these uh, molecular unidirectional motors in a, in a pillared fashion. The interesting thing for me, and uh, we can talk about this after if you want, 
um, is that the barrier in DMF solution and the barrier for the material, which is still soaked, but now is in the, in the solid state, is about the same. So this going from solution to solid state is not having any effect on the, on the barrier or the working of the machine. It's still functioning. But now we've organized them, and you can start to think about you know, having perhaps different machines and interactions, right? If we, if we can make all these beautiful molecular machines and motors and things, we, we want to take all these little components and, and get to interact with each other. So our contribution uh, when we first started this was to uh, show that the rotation of the, of the ring of a rotaxane uh, could be identified and made to, made to happen inside one of these materials. And we've pretty much, I would say, exhausted this now, as you can tell from this slide. So our first material, um, we use deuterium labels again because deuterium NOR is beautiful at, at giving you the, the dynamics of, of what's going on. And uh, we've made many of these materials, so we've done it with just a single uh, rotaxane linker. We've done it uh, like the Feringa group, uh, one I just showed you, where we have pillars that interact. We've done it where the rotaxane is off the side in sort of a T-shape rather than along the axle. And we've done this uh, with odd-shaped ones and, and a variety of others. Um, I would tell you that all the NMR pretty much look exactly the same which is a little bit gratifying, but some, somehow boring after a while. Um, and you get, again, the same kind of thing, the, the shape analysis is the same kind of thing that, that uh, Miguel showed us yesterday. But it is a diff you know, it's not exactly the same. There's still a slow and intermediate and a fast regime that you're looking at, uh, but of course it's not a simple rotor. So that if the deuterium markers are here, you can have alkyl chain flipping up and down. That's not very exciting, but you do see it at low temperatures. And then you can imagine that the, the crown ether, in this case, macrocycle, starts to vary its hydrogen bonding from one oxygen to another, passing over a small chain. And then once you get enough, once you get enough energy in there, then it can basically uh, pass over the larger chain, and it's essentially undergoing full rotation at the, at the highest temperatures. Now, this is not unidirectional rotation. It's just rotation of a rotaxane in a solid. A really cool paper by the, uh, well, I guess it's by the Stoddart, the Farhar, the Hup, the Schnur, uh, a, a Northwestern uh, a family uh, adventure here, uh, was to embed this beautiful uh, bistable catenane inside a moth. And this is one of these ones that's done post synthetically. So the Farhar group made this um, very uh, large poured material they call NU for Northwestern 1000, and it has open sites on the metals. And so the holes are so big, you can pre-make the molecule. So the, we know how this works in solution long before we put it in solid state. We know that we can do redox chemistry to change the oxidation state of this sulfur-containing entity here, and this ring will rotate, and you can switch it back and forth. So this is a, a well-known thing in the Stoddard started group, but what they did was they managed to use this carboxylate to tether it to the metal, embed it inside NU1000, and then show that the same redox chemistry and the same switching between the two states, bistable molecular switch, uh, interlock molecule can, can happen and rotate and operate inside a, um, a metal organic framework. It's beautiful work. So the interesting part about all these rotaxane, catenane, motor, unidirectional, and, and, and rotors, is that when it comes to building them into the material, they all kind of have the same uh, criteria. You just need enough space, right? You need what we call free volume. You just need enough space for, for the motion to be able to occur, right? No steric hindrance to that. But when you think about it, the, the atoms in this ring don't have to carve out any more volume inside the material than they occupy, okay? so. Same with the rotor, right? So these blades are rotating, but they're rotating in, the, in, a, in, a, in a volume that's defined by that molecule. If we want to make a molecular shuttle operate in solution, that's fine. We don't have to worry about what's here. We just move the ring over by whatever means we're going to. But in the solid state, if you want to include a uh, molecular shuttle into this, this large amplitude motion, you have to make not only room for this ring, but you have to make that space where the ring can move as well. So it's a little more 
complicated, a little more challenging. So this large amplitude motion, um, again, I think this is the one that uh, maybe Alberto showed. This is the original uh, publication from the Stoddard Group. Uh, I think the title was A Molecular Shuttle, very elegant back in the day. So again, I think everybody knows how these work, but uh, the uh, blue box ring, as, as, they, as we call it, wants to either sit here or sit here and interact with those electron-rich rings, and it really can't make up its mind, so it shuttles to and fro between those two. And in solution, that barrier is about 13 kcals in acetone. And then, of course, if you take the same concept and you adjust it a little bit, and I just picked this first example, you can make a degenerate shuttle that's just moving back and forth, right, undergoing that motion driven by thermal bath, you can, you can start to control that. So because these nitrogens can be protonated, you can, you can change this system, which likes to sit here 84% of the time and 16 here. By protonating it, you drive the ring just charge-wise over here, and so you've got a, you've got a bi-stable situation. You can c control with chemistry, and of course, in solution, you can control these with, with light. Um, Alberta's done fantastic work uh, using light-driven things, and you can do redox and all, all the all the kinds of uh, stimuli you could think of. In a solid state, of course, this is a, a, a bigger challenge. So we uh, took up this challenge a few years ago, and we, we made one big change to what was going on. Because remember I talked about how not only do we have to create space here for the ring, we also have to create space here for the ring to move to. And so instead of, instead of wrapping the ring around our linker, we decided to kind of put it into this crossbar motif we call it, so, the, so the, the, the actual shuttling is done not along the connector, but between two connectors. So I'll just take you through the details of this and then uh, let you have another Steve. So a little synthetic chemistry, I've I'm, I'm just got this out here because, well, synthetic chemistry is important, but just to show you that what you're doing is you're taking this ring and you're moving it from one benzimidazole here to another benzimidazole and that these two places where I have asterisk are carbon-13 labeled. And so what we're going to do is prove, not by deuterium NMR, but by carbon-13 NMR, how, how this functions. So in solution, oh, sorry, got to do the solid state first. So design, I thought a design principle would be good here. So this is the, I showed you this one already with the yellow sphere in the center. And it's cubic, and it's called IRMOF-16. And what we decided was, it turns out that if you make these things big enough, nature doesn't like the vacuum, the big pores, and sometimes it'll just grow another lattice in that space to fill it, right? And that's what happens. So IR MOF 15 is the interpenetrated version of IR MOF 16. And what we decided was to target the two of these. So we're going to grow, we're going to insert our crossbar between the blue cube and the red cube. So that's what we did. We made a material in which we have the just like the cartoon I showed you, we have the, the struts between the, the um, clusters, and then we build the uh, crossbar in between. And so this ring is going to move from one position to the other. And that's about between, it's about a nanometer that it's got to actually move. So it's a, we call it a large amplitude motion. It's got to do that in the solid state. So first of all, what we do is we go to solution and we say, well, what do we expect to see? So in solution, we just, this is classic, uh, Physorg chemistry, we just do a VT NMR experiment and show that at you know, room temperature, this ring is going back and forth very quickly so that we only get one peak, you cool it down, you can generate two, and then you can uh, get the appropriate plot to show that the barrier for this is about eight kilocalories per mole. Okay, so it's a, it's a non-competitive solvent, but we're only breaking one simple NHO interaction and reforming it so the barrier's pretty, pretty low. So, Essentially, what you do is you make your material and just do the same experiment in the solid state. When you do it in the solid state, things are a little broader, but it behaves exactly the same way. So in the solid state, inside that material, inside those zinc crystals, this ring goes back and forth. Uh, the barrier's about almost twice the size. Again, if you want to, we can talk about perhaps why that's happening. But the experiment's the same. You, you start above room temperature and you cool it down and it goes through coalescence and you can, and you can see this happen. So I just want to finish with uh, what we're doing now, just to give you a, a kind of feel for, for, where, for where this is going. Um, we're moving to zirconium because these big zirconium clusters are fantastically um, robust materials. The zinc guys, not so much. Um, we, we managed to make it, make it through that, but they're not very robust. 
and we target these, this particular moth, which has two, so this is one single material that has two openings, that has these huge um, cavities that are about 23 angstroms across, and we have these smaller tetrahedral cavities that are about 16 angstroms across. And it turns out that uh, a crossbar with two fennel rings will span right across here between there and there. So that's, that's the perfect distance. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a material that's not made out of one linker but two. One of these linkers is going to be a, a molecular shuttle and the other is going to be either the one I just showed you with four methyl groups or one with four nitrogen groups or just four CH groups. And the interesting part here that makes this another level of sophistication is we can make all three of these materials and the shuttling is different in all three of them. So we're trying to think about why that's happening. So just show you how you do it. You simply mix these in a four to one ratio. You put it in what we call the moth oven and you come back in a couple of days and you fish out your crystals. That's the easy part. And what you're doing then is you're installing this uh, molecular shuttle inside these tetrahedral cavities, but you have these other linkers holding the rest of it together. And you can figure out the ratios by decomposing them and, and running, running solution NMR. So this is what one of the cavities looks like. This is what's, what's going on. And so what you're looking at here on the right, um, there, is, there is two NMRs there. The one in the middle is not there. I'll tell you about that in a sec. And what you're looking at is you're looking at the same thing we were looking at in, in solution and in our other solids. You're looking at the carbon-13 labeled positions on either end, so complexed and uncomplexed ends of this molecular shuttle. So it turns out that when these other groups here are methyl groups on these other linkers, you get two peaks, and you get two peaks at every single temperature, which is a bit disappointing because that means nothing's moving, right? And so if you look closely at this structure, you can see it. If I was to put this in space filling, it is pretty clear that those methyl groups are blocking that ring. So it's, it's a really fine line, right? There's, there's not too much stair crowding because I can make the material. It wouldn't be able to make it if it was too sterically crowded, but it's too sterically crowded to push by that methyl. And because that ring wants to be pointing into that cavity, there's not much I can do about that. So what we did was we figured, let's, let's make one where the opposite would be true. So the case where there's four nitrogens, um, yeah, so the one, the one other case where there's four nitrogens, and I don't have the spectrum here because my postdoc forgot to send it to me, um, is moving fast. So when you put the nitrogens, this ring rotates and it becomes in the plane and there's nothing to block, okay? And then the cool part is, if you just have CHs here where this ring can probably rotate, it's in between. So this one is flat, it's almost coalescence at room temperature, this one's not moving, this one's moving fast, and this one's moving somewhere in between. And so the one is locked, the one is locked, the gate is closed, and the shuttle can't move, one is open because it's completely planar and it moves fast and I can, I'll give you the number someday. We'll, I'll have the VT and next week I'll have the number for that. But in between, this guy is rotating and the other, and this guy is shuttling at the same time. And I don't have the spectra here to show you, but I can tell you that um, if you do the deuterium NMR labeling experiment and you watch this rotate, it rotates at a different speed when the shuttle's there and when the shuttle's not there. So it may be what you're looking at is the first example of where we're starting to organize these things in the solid state and they're interacting. So one component, in this case a simple rotor, is affecting the other, which is a molecular shuttle. So this is the reason that I think putting these things in the solid state and organizing them uh, is a, a fruitful thing to do. So let me just finish by showing you one final thing. Um, what I've shown you up to now in terms of shuttles are these degenerate guys, so the, the ring doesn't care, the energy level's the same, but of course, like in, in Fraser's uh, catenate, it would be nice to make this into a bistable, controllable, switchable, on-off situation. And we can do that by making one unbelievably simple, at least in ChemDraw, change. We just take one of the CHs and we put a nitrogen there, and that repels the ring and it wants to sit there, so that's our starting point. But it turns out these little cavities are really just perfect for binding lithium ions, and they do it very well. And so what you can do is you can just add lithium to this, and it, and it shuttles. And so all we have to do uh, is take two room temperature carbon-13 NMRs. I won't bore you with another NMR, but 
we can turn the ring, we can move the ring from one side to the other and control this with the add and addition and subtraction of lithium ions. And so um, I think solution chemistry is way ahead of solid state chemistry. It's not easy. You've got to redesign all that floppy, all those floppy molecules and make them rigid and put them into these containers. But I think this is a really good way to, to start thinking about modularly putting molecular machines and having them interact. So the more components we can have, the more we can get in and interact and learn how to do this, I think, the better. And it should be, um, I think it's the way. And, and you know, MOFs aren't the only frameworks. There are, if you're, in, if you're familiar, there are COFs there. You can, you can do it in ZIFs. There are all sorts of modular materials that you can make these with. So uh, we've done all these. And, uh, and I look forward to telling you about real results instead of just ghost NMRs. And these are the people who did all the work at one of uh, my birthday parties, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So, who's going to be first? Yes. Uh, yeah. Should I just come to the office? Have you tried looking at the low energy vibrational dynamics of these systems when they've got the, uh, the rituxane linker in there? Is there any particular dynamic that's showing, like a phonon mode, for example, that's showing a, this translational motion of the ring? It's an easy answer. No. no. <laughs> I haven't, I've never looked at that. Enough. Yeah, it sounds interesting. It's not something I know much about. But so, can for example, about. you can see ligand rotations, ligand uh, movements in yeah. low energy sort of terahertz region of the vibrational Yes, spectrum. yes, yes. So I've I proposed looking into this in the past, but never actually found a system that had a nice sort of interlock system on the linker to be able to do it. So maybe there's some interest in that. OK, we can talk about it after, sure. Yeah, sounds good. Interesting. All right, uh, Steve, you might have another collaborator if you're interested. <laughs> That's why we're here. Great. He's at Oak Ridge, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Thank you, Steve. And, uh, Thanks. It's been good fun. Yeah. Thanks a lot.